feel incredibly fortunate to be with this incredible group. So let me do some quick introductions, um, and then we'll dive in. A lot of ground to cover. Um, Michelle Hooper, to my immediate right, is uh, the head of marketing at Searchlight, EVP. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you. Michael Barker, of course, co-head of Sony Pictures Classics. Welcome to you, Michael. Thank you. Um, Stacy Spikes is uh, co-founder co of Movie Pass, founded the Urban World Film Festival, uh, which he still runs, along with his new company, Pre-Show. So, yeah. Welcome to you, Stacy. Thank you. Tom Quinn uh, is styling with his glasses. <laughs> we love. <laughs> No, no, no. I, like grandpa. Right. <laughs> uh, fresh off his honor at Woodstock. Uh, and here he's the head of Neon. And uh, we're delighted to have you, Tom. Thank you. And last but not least, Ariana Baco, who runs IFC Films uh, as the president. Welcome to you. Thank you. Well, gosh, what? Yeah, please give it up for these guys. Um, oh, and just so you don't think I'm trying to remain anonymous, my name is Dade Hayes. I'm the business editor at Deadline. Um, so again, just so, so glad. Um, my goal is to talk as little as possible because this group has so much great insight. Um, toss up question, whoever wants to jump in. Uh, it's in a way the question that bedevils <laughs> all of us moviegoers, people in the distribution game, every, per every stakeholder. And that is just what would you say is the current condition of commercial exhibition. I mean, in your immediate area, you do business with everybody. But I mean, if you were assessing <laughs> a condition to the patients, are they, you know, out of the ICU? Are they <laughs> recovering? Are they? I mean, what what would you say? Just the general health of the industry is at this moment. Uh, I, I'll jump in. So, we just finished our festival. Um, demand and love of seeing movies in person, I don't think is lessened at all. I think there's still the COVID concerns. Um, there's still a lot of people who are choosing not to get vaccinated or they're unsure, but we're seeing it in the box office numbers, the big numbers that are starting to come in. People wanna go back. And, um, and I think that's a really strong sign even when we're playing with the day and date windows, but that the demand is high. Um, I would say that uh, this festival in particular, I've been to five screenings at night at Alice Tully Hall, 1,060 people, totally full. All of them standing ovations, uh, $30 a ticket. That's impressive. And not only that, but a very large contingency of folks that look like they're under 25, which I don't know. Those, those are all signs to me that feels like we're on the right track. The other thing is this past weekend was the biggest weekend aggregate for New York since July 2nd. Um, and I think some of what's not being discussed in the industry, you know, there hasn't been a lot of really fantastic movies for people to go out to, to take the risk of, feeling comfortable in a theater. Um, and so some of the larger movies certainly have generated significant mainstream box office, but you know, the platform film, the specialized film, you know, I think this is the first weekend and over the next four to six weeks, we'll see what the appetite is. Um, the last thing I want to say is, you know, LA is missing its big gun theater for the films that we work on. You know, we opened, to 10 this weekend did really well, 500,000 plus dollars for any foreign language film. That film specifically is a great number. But you know what's missing in there, honestly, is 90 to 100,000 dollars from the arc light. So that, that's, 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 that hurts for the second biggest market. Yeah, I would say generally, you know, we're, we are bouncing back. So I'm incredibly optimistic about where we're heading. We have two bigger art house films opening up and Q4, we have Bergman Island and Benedetta, both which we're screening here. And the response for both was phenomenal, just really exceeded expectation. So I really am optimistic that audiences are eager to get back. They are engaged. They're very engaged. And um, I do have a lot of hope. I think that we will see changes, you know, coming up in 2020 and perhaps how we release films. But one of the things that keeps me optimistic is that there's a lot more flexibility in how we can release films. 
which can benefit the films in the end. And so I'm really taking a very optimistic approach. And I also think in some ways, you know, we, a lot of, you know, Tom and I have been veterans of the, the day and date world for a long time. Um, and now that larger companies are experimenting with day and date, um, I think that there's going to be a bit of a throwback to traditional theatrical. Yeah, yeah what happened? You guys were going to destroy the whole business. Right <laughs> I, I, I guess not. Um, I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me bring it to this end of the uh, of, of the group here, because um, I just want to get both of your thoughts on whether, I mean, I think these are well-taken points that there are encouraging signs everywhere, and particularly in the mainstream market, we're coming off of a $90 million opening. Uh, we've had Shang-Chi. We've had a series of big wide releases that have proven the you know the theatrical appetite but what about in your world you know just in in, in where you mainly play in the specialty business you know you're you've got one up your sleeve that people are very excited about in french dispatch um closing night film yet again with uh, pedro Almodovar, parallel mothers that's another notable title so is it going to take one of those to pop are you seeing green shoots in the specialty market that kind of give you hope? I mean, I'm, I'm incredibly optimistic. I want to echo what Tom and Ariana have already said. Um, we're, we're, I mean, honestly, we're looking very carefully at what's happening with French Dispatch coming uh, in the next couple of weeks. And um, on the 22nd, it opens in uh, 12 cities. And then we're going to be 50 cities the following week. And um, I, I think we're going to go, you know, faster than we originally anticipated. And um, I, I think it'll be a real true test of, of the specialized market. I mean, if, if sub Saturday night was any indication, you know, a Avery Fisher Hall was, was jammed. Um, it played gangbusters. And there was, you know, a lot of lines around the block also for the, uh, the 12 p.m. the next day. So... Um, I mean, Wes Anderson is an artist with a fan base. It's his 10th film. And um, I, I feel like people are going to come come out and see it. And um, I don't live in New York, but um, in my four days here, I not only went and saw movies, but went to the opera and went to and saw a dance, a dance recital yesterday. And everything was jammed. And there's nothing like art to bring people together and celebrate. And it's the, there, there's nothing that takes place of sitting in the dark room with a bunch of strangers sharing an experience together. Um, and um, I look forward to, to uh, getting back to that. Amen. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think that, first of all, we're all in agreement that people are slowly coming back to the theaters. Second, what's been said before, I think it's important there have to be catalyst films that cause them to come back. We have seen in the history of the movie business, lulls in the movie business until Star Wars came out or whatever comes out that wakens everybody to get back in the film going habit. There's a feeling in the mainstream sort of way that Bond, James Bond is gonna do this. And if we, you look at what happened in England, it did do that, where people of all ages came and everyone's looking to see if people of all ages are gonna turn out to the theater and start going to the movies again. People are looking to Dune to do that, although this whole HBO Max day and date, which I don't get because watching that on HBO Max is like on television, is like watching Lawrence Baraby on a postage stamp to me. But the fact of the matter is, the concerns are, 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 are very specific, actually. It's, it's all about how long is it going to take to get people to become more comfortable to go to the theaters. The younger people, as been said already, they are coming out. So how long is it going to take for the older generation to come out? Because the older generation is as important to us as the people below 25. And so it's important that we understand that is slower than it has been before. But I am convinced um, that the theatrical is here to stay. I think you look at the history of motion picture business, it's had many disruptors since 1895. But the point is, 
what is also going to stay is the idea that all the films we have are films with long tails. And if the theatrical comes back, and even if it doesn't come on, back quite in the same extent revenue-wise as it did before, that theatrical impression is what gives these films the long tail and the chemistry of where the revenue comes from each of the different platforms in the life of a long tail of a picture, it, it will change as it has always changed, you know? And I remember when we were so shocked that the DVD sell-through, you know, on a Chinese movie could be $29 million. It's not there anymore, so we have to find it elsewhere. And that's been so difficult. It hasn't quite happened the way we thought. But the fact of the matter is, I think, all this news is good. I think, though, we have a giant task ahead of us. And I think um, one of the things that's very comforting to us is that when you have change like AMC and Alamo and Landmark, you know, it's, it's like a lot of the onus is actually going to be on exhibitors to work with these distributors to, to get help get these people back into the theaters. And, some of the chains are much more efficient than others. Some are at different levels of coming back. But the fact of the matter is, it's a longer haul than we thought it was going to be. And that's what I think is happening. Yeah, we don't have a voice from exhibition on this panel. Uh, but if, you know, to the best of your ability, or just you know, maybe from your vantage points, I mean, what do you all think should be their role? Or is it even beyond them? Is it a, is it a civic public health you know government function coming in and like because i always wonder you know why are people just in my day-to-day -day life i can only imagine what you guys are hearing and studying just as professionals but i just get a lot of feedback from people saying you know i'm not totally comfortable i don't want to be in a crowded room etc and i keep telling them not that i'm a flag waver for the industry but i say you know there's really not been an outbreak you know there weddings in Maine that are more contagious, more spreader events than anything. I'm going to either. correct you in that because no. there's a major portion of this country that are totally anti-vaxxers. Right. I just came York. back from Texas and right. it was a totally horrendous uh, thing true. that I witnessed. And also I think a lot of people are getting COVID through the Delta variant. And I think uh, 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 older audiences are really paying attention to that. And so that I think that's very much so with that, us in this moment. Interesting. So that that's a, I, so yeah. And no, go ahead. Well, I was just, we we own a theater downtown, the IFC Center, um, and I can speak just you know anecdotally from what we're seeing there, which is that you know it, we have to provide entertainment that people want to come back to. Um, you know, they did a Wong Kar Wai retrospective, which really had elevated the attendance um, and. We're doing a, a Bergman, Mia Hansen Love retrospective. We're going to do another one later in the year. So I think that, you know, people are slowly coming back. And I think that once they take that dip in the water, then they see, okay, it's, it's safe. We're providing every safety measure for them, listening to feedback. So it is, to Michael's point, it is a, it's a relationship. It's a mutual relationship that between exhibition and, and the audience we're, we're giving them reason to come back and we're making it safe for them and it's a dialogue. But it's so far, it's, it's incredibly encouraging. I mean, would you say a series of macro factors would have to line up the, you know, the, the, the sort of diminishment of the Delta variant, et cetera, that that's gonna be the threshold event, do you think? No, I, th I think it's all happening. It's okay. just all of these elements are in play, right. you know? Right, right. And it's not as predictable. We can't give you the finite date. <laughs> and right. that has been the issue. We, right. a lot of us thought it was gonna happen quicker than it's happened. Sure, and it's a business That's why so many yeah. companies are moving their dates back, hoping that there's more mass of audience. Well, let me pick up also on, on a point Ariana made that you guys are all, you know, hard at work at figuring out, which is the business models. And it's not going to be one answer every, I mean, just try to give an idea, give the folks uh, here some sense of, because it's, it's probably been evolving, it's been changing, technology is, you know, uh, disrupting things even before the pandemic, but just you know, on the dashboard that you're looking at of possible ways to get movies into the world, to make them make sense to you, to your partners financially, um, 
just how much more are you considering doing that maybe you hadn't, you know, two, three, four years ago? I mean, I'll, I'll jump in to start this off. So we founded Movie Pass in 2012. And just to be clear, I'm speaking of it through 2017. <laughs> I exited and then it went off the cliff with the uh, private equity group that bought it and thought $10 was a good idea, um, <clears throat> that that would be sustainable. Where like, okay. Um, but what we found, just to put some real data out there, was wherever the person was in their attendance before subscription, they doubled that behavior every month. And so we did, it's, it's actually called the Mather Report um, that got published where we did a double blind um, over a one year period that they looked at all of the AMC data of their behavior prior to joining a movie pass or a subscription service. And then they looked at it a year after and every month they doubled their behavior. Most of the exhibitors have said they try and double that behavior one additional time a year. Um, so we hadn't seen any type of lift like that, whether it was IMAX or, you know, discount Tuesdays or anything this thing supercharged movie going in a way. And I know in, in my last year there, we were 5% of all movie sales and we were 30% of most independent sales. Uh, I know Lady Bird, we were 30% of all tickets. So what we found was subscription, because people paid up front, they tended to take risk on titles that they maybe wouldn't have taken a risk on. and. That's what I think to the younger demographic, that's the shift is not content as much. It's changing the business model that they don't have to think about every single transaction. It's like, I'll pay in advance, but let me not have to think about it. So we saw evidence of that and, and it clearly worked. Yeah, any thoughts just to follow on that from you guys on more of the distribution and marketing side on subscription? I know that, I mean, it's funny, MoviePass, you're, you're right, it was sort of the noise around it and the, I think we can all agree, the sort of questionable business decisions kind of clouded the issue of, you know, around the world, there are very viable subscription plans. I mean, I don't know, would you guys be welcome? Is that, is that concept a welcome concept to the rest of you? I mean, I, I can only speak to my own experience working at Searchlight. And um, a couple of years ago, we were bought by Disney. And, um, you know, our, our new mandate is, is uh, six films a year that will be theatrical releases. And we're now ramping up and um, we'll be ultimately working towards 14 films, original Searchlight films that will... Uh, debut on Hulu every year as well, which is, you know, three to four times more than we've ever done um, in the course of a year. So, I mean, it's an exciting time for us. Um, you know, we're ramping up and, and uh, stepping up to the challenge of multiple films of production, pre-production. Um, obviously, we still are out there looking for films to acquire also. Um, and, you know, ob obviously Disney sees our value as a, 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 I hate to call film content, but for, for Hulu, you know, providing films for Hulu, um, in addition to what we've done since the films, I mean, sorry, the company's inception, which is theatrical releases as well. So, right. and let me, let me just stay with this for a second. So, um, those Hulu titles, at least as it's stipulated now would not play in theaters is that right or, well or i mean might. you don't they might be a, it might be a day and date situation okay. i mean you know we the, one thing that you know is as horrible as the past 18 months has been it's also been a time of experimentation right. and um you know being as nimble as you possibly can you know we tried you know a few different times to release nomad land and kept moving the date and moving the date yeah. and, um, you know, ultimately ended up, you know, qualifying in, in it in New York only in December of 2020 and then doing an IMAX release the end of January. 
and then releasing it theatrical and on Hulu in, in February, I think it was February 19th of 2021. Right. So, you know, it was just constantly pivoting every time something yeah. new developed. And, you know, luckily we had an extremely tight relationship with the filmmakers where we were completely transparent about what we were doing and why we were doing it. And, you know, we kind of walked through each evolution of the release together and Summer of Soul, which is a film that we acquired out of Sundance virtually, which was unusual. Um, and we did, you know, just a one week it play to here in, in New York at the Magic Johnson uh, Theater up in Harlem. And then we did uh, El Capitan. And then a week later, it, it debuted on, on Hulu. So it, it just depends. We're, we're open to... to you know what whatever we think makes the most sense for that individual film so uh I, it, it's not a, a a cookie cutter situation so that's the best part about what you're saying michelle is that we've been saying for 15 years as independents radius ifc magnolia trying to figure out how to make the business sustainable for the kinds of movies that we do uh it's not a one size fits all and and so you know it's it's been fun for us sitting on the sidelines kind of watching the industry magically explore and experiment with these new found tools collapsing windows and we're like guys we, we've been doing this for a long time it's just now we're all doing it and you know the amount of data that i know ariana has and i have uh and what that looks like moving the window two weeks going day and date this price point there's a real price resistance for people under 25 you know and the thing that's disheartening for me is that we're not all working together exhibitions not working with distribution the studios aren't working with the independents and you know this is part of the reason why i left universal as my home entertainment provider because they thought they had found some newfangled wonderful way of doing day and date and i was like that, that doesn't work for every film the 30 dollars price point the 20 dollars price point is a mistake for a movie like pig starring nicholas yeah, cage I, I was going to bring up the pricing because i think that's a really key like and i thought of it when you were just saying what you were saying because you know premiere access i think is a really interesting you know if you think of it in the main i think it's a pretty it has some potential. The thirty dollar surcharge, you know, I would say maybe you could you could be more flexible with that. But but just maybe expand on that, Tom. Like, was there a number that you had in mind, or it was just well, more... it's you know we 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 experimented with four dollars, five dollars, seven dollars, ten dollars. Ten dollars was the sort of premium ultra VOD price point. So I, I don't want to get into the details. The, the point is is that you know there's so many ways to do this. You know the idea that a streaming window. Once it launches on streaming, it's going to be there for the rest of the term. It's kind of stupid. I mean, why not do it one night, one night only, take it down, build some word of mouth, and let's go into theater. You know, the, the idea that we are not using all the tools at our disposal in a way that can serve specifically that film is kind of crazy to me. And there's so much more for us left to do. And, and the best part about the pandemic was that Comcast and AMC were talking. And, and, and that to me was something that I had always wanted to have happen. And you know what? Right. The best model of all is let the audience decide where they want to see it. And the last film we did at Radius was a film called It Follows. And the plan was, God, I wish I had all this P&A to launch it. Why? Because I think it really works. But the test course says, you know, it's, it's too niche. It's too, um, it it's, doesn't fit the mold of a stereotypical horror film. And I planned a basically a 17 day VOD window. And let's see what the grosses are gonna be on Thursday night. Uh, it was a platform launch in New York and LA. And we did $6,000 at the Arclight. I was like, oh my God, this thing's off and running. This is a wide release. And we had prepared all of the VOD providers except for Time Warner, because they wouldn't have played ball. They knew that if we could gross, we were gonna pull the VOD window and we were gonna go wide. And that's what happened. And that was the perfect audible. And if the industry would only come together, we could literally do every single movie that way. One interesting ingredient in what you're saying, I think it's a very, I mean, I, I certainly think that's a bunch of great points, but I would say data is an important element in that, right? I mean, that's the thing I'm curious, and, and this is for any, any of you guys, but 
you do need some access to what's in that black box, right? Like even to, and today, streaming is so dominant that it's even more, you know, there's, there's less data than ever, arguably, coming out. Um, so, I mean, to what extent are you reliant? You mentioned some of the push and pull with the traditional, you know, uh, via V, you know, the, the, the on-demand partners, but isn't that true of just about anybody who would put a movie on streaming? I mean, unless you're inside, the Walt Disney Company or, you know, some other really fully resourced company? I mean, do you guys I mean, sort of even, even for... being inside the Walt <laughs> Disney inside. Company, there's still, I mean, yeah. we don't, Disney doesn't wholly own Hulu, True. Um, you know, yet. Um, but I do look forward to to seeing, you know, I, I believe Neon's pay one window is Hulu, and I'd love to see how some of their library titles I, I would too that would be amazing <laughs> See, that I, would be amazing I, I, I guys fantasy, let's work together what do you say I have this fantasy of all you guys just walking into a big conference room with a screen about that size and it's just full of like data points and like some sort of but, but the other part is guess what I, I would say don't be driven by the data either you know, because the data tells me that Titan should, not, nobody should ever see Titan. But the reality is in my world, Titan right. is the right. future of cinema, right. one of the most amazing experiences that I've had seeing it with my team in our screening room. And we literally were, we couldn't sit still watching it. So, you know, the data says all these other things. And, and, and I think you have to know how to interpret the data. You know, I think it has to be a kind of, a, it's the content will drive the data, but but you have to know how to interpret it. And it certainly is going to inform a lot of people's acquisition choices, I think. And, um, and that's what you might start seeing. And I think you already are seeing a lot of homogenous kinds of content on the streaming platforms, um, which is, n is completely the opposite of what Tom and I do. You know, we, we are instinctually driven by talent and by talent that we're choosing to support in a lot of cases, um, that's not to say that you don't make decisions, you know, based based on data or business decisions. But um, if we, in my opinion, if we lose that and what motivates our strategic choices for acquisitions, then we're going to see a real downward turn in the in the in the film uh, world, in the ecosystem of of the film world, and, and and what you know what is being presented to audiences for. Um, choices in which in which to watch. The one thing I'll add, kind of behind that about data was, so our our algorithms we started to see within ten percent accuracy where people went, so which which venues they chose, what day part times they chose. We also saw um, you could tell actually when they would go into the app. And they started to what they were looking at for the upcoming weekend. Um, that pre data actually told us where people were going to go and what was going to happen. And as you know, Thomas said several times, I remember when we first started, we put up Movie Pass, and I remember walking into exhibitors and studios. And I remember going into like Warner Brothers with a binder and saying, look at this. And there was, well, we just can't get our minds around <laughs> subscription. We don't want to have a conversation. And I remember us going to um, Alamo Draft House, and we were able to show where a consumer was going to AMC on, on Friday and Saturday, but they were going to Alamo on Wednesday. And we found out it had to do because of half off beer. It wasn't yeah, yeah, even, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it didn't even have, they were willing to go take a risk on the movie because of half off beer. But yeah. our data was able to look across the exhibitors and look beyond just <laughs> titles. So there's all of these factors that were coming in. And that, that when we were trying to show the data to people, people didn't want to look at it. And I was like, guys, I come from distribution. This is this is gold. You should be looking at this. Anyway. But by the way, the one thing I do know about Alamo Draft House, our films sell more alcohol than the studio films. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which is I, I it's a great fact. You I have mean to I, somehow promote that more actively. I don't know. If you drink, you will like neon <laughs> films. <laughs> Better with beer. Yeah. Oh, that's good. I mean there <laughs> we've already <laughs> 
you've already surfaced so many interesting um, aspects to the just the magic of the movies. I mean, I you know we we're all very emotionally connected to it. And Tom, I'm so glad you brought up ArcLight because um, it's a question that's out there, which is, you know, does there need to be contraction? Could you make a more efficient? And I hate to use that's such a kind of corporate word, but could you make a more sensible, robust system? You know, if you just steamed out a certain, I don't even know the number, but do you believe from your end, that might be true on the big studio end, but for the movies that require so much care and feeding, and Michael, you're right, they play all over the country and all kinds of, you know, we get so absorbed about New York that we don't, you know, but do you think there could be benefits from a reduction of screen? No. Here's the thing. First of all, we all talk about past what's going on now and every what, what's different from the long past is the in the long past people with all these companies were very similar you know in the activities they would do to get the highest amount of revenues and the highest number of eyeballs to their movie but now what happens is every one of these companies like all the companies on this every one of these companies is different it's like not only we all have a similar interest and getting as many people to see the movies and getting as much revenue as we can for our movies. However, it's really the infrastructure, that's mine, I'm sorry. It's really the infrastructure of each one of these companies that dictates how they're going to get the movies. Whether it's, it's Fox, uh, a Fox search like having a relationship with Disney and Hulu, whether it's, it's, it's Tom having, you know, that relationship they have. Everyone has it's and it's the infrastructure it's the infrastructure of the company that you're in and i can tell you i i am very fortunate we'll be at sony classics 30 years this end of december and one of the keys we are not a company sony is not a company that has their platform that has this special and to be honest with you most of our films will have the seven month window with theatrical and home entertainment and our company, I could include Columbia Pictures and all the different companies under Sony, uh, they, they uh, recognize the revenues from as many platforms as possible. That has to do with the structure of how you're set up and the infrastructure of the marketing and the data. And when you have Netflix who has their own structure that's so different from all of ours and they have data none of us have and, and Amazon and, and so many others, I think we have to look at the business in that way, you know, how each company is going to serve these pictures in the best possible way. And that being said, what is consistent is the theater going experience is still something that will always mean something substantial, whether you talk about contracting or more or whatever. And that, you know, watching Dune in IMAX in, uh, Toronto was one of the greatest experiences of my life. And anyone who sees that on a small screen, you're out of your mind. Go to IMAX is the best sound design you ever saw in your life. And, and so this is, this is the thing. The movie business has always been about adapting to change. And this is the kind of change we're adapting to, that every one of these companies is different. And every one of them has a point of view that actually might make a lot of sense in what's best for the pictures that they have. But they're different. I mean, I think, I think we might not be benefiting from the loss of the screens, but it's the reality. And I think we are losing some screens. But I think what's going to happen, if I could offer something slightly different, is that the movie-going experience might improve. Um, and I think that it Amen kind of... Amen uh, Well, you know, I, the, the mall, there's a 12-plex in a mall by where I live, and it's awful. It's dirty. It's, like, unmanned. It's it's just not a good experience and i think what we what we might hopefully see uh, is more community-based um uh movie going experiences where you know you will know the people who are there and there'll be a more uh give and take relationship and i think that that is what i foresee the future to be and i think that that's going to be amazing and you know it's happening in a small way when you go to ifc or you go to film forum to see a humphrey bogart film it's like you're surrounded with people that are into it like you are, and they're new, and they're young, and they're not just like me, you know? And it's, it's exciting. It's a, it's a community that's being 
that's happening, and it's happening in a much bigger way as these exhibitors adapt to a better environment yeah. in which to watch a movie. And I think that can happen on a commercial level, not just a retrospective level, yeah. too. So can I throw out something that just got mentioned that I want to almost ask a question? So when Two Popes came out, right, and it was on Netflix, and I live near the IFC, and I went to see it, packed. Mm -hmm. Even though it was right there on Netflix, completely packed. Why? So, I know the answer, yeah. but I'm just yeah, throwing yeah. it out. But, but because, you know, I, I, I'm not going to answer myself, but. I can tell you that wouldn't happen in Kerrville, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> But maybe in Austin. I mean, maybe. I think I think that there's there is there is room for that. And I, you know, I haven't been paying attention on the, the Sopranos movie this weekend. But you know, I think that there's there is so much room for um, and Netflix. That you know, I can't speak for them, but I don't. This is just to get the attention. Like you know, the, if they had put. Um, the Irishman only in theaters or Roma only in theaters, you know, the IFC center benefited. Yeah, sure. People, it was packed for weeks on end with those movies, but, um, but it should, it should have had a traditional window in my opinion. Yeah, of course. But a lot of what you're talking about is also in the moment of what we're going through now. You know, when we had the father and we kept moving it back, like you were talking about nomad land and we kept moving it back and moving it back. And it was like, okay, we got to open. We open, opened, okay. And then you have, you're confronted with the idea of you have a movie that's nominated for Best Picture and you have to go wide and there aren't enough theaters to play it wide because of the pandemic. So you make an arrangement, Sony Home Entertainment makes an arrangement with different platforms to have a, a three week or three to four week PVOD where it's 1999. And, and it does very well in that brief period of time. But the fact is you're adapting to that moment. You're not really changing the whole menu, you know, for the, your future world, but you adapt to that moment. In the middle of the pandemic, we wanted to film. We, we didn't know how to be active. And we, we, had, we attached ourselves to this film, 12 Mighty Orphans, where we asked the home entertainment to make arrangements with everyone from Costco to Walmart to Red Box because it was like a Rudy kind of athlete movie and it was a period piece. It wasn't really a mainstream movie. It wasn't an art movie either. And we opened it in 126 theaters in Texas and it was in Tribeca. And there was a way to make money and then the window was shorter. It's a way to make money in the environment of what we were living in at the moment. And I think a lot of the things we're seeing has to do with that. But, Netflix, but Michael, that but was the, the first, that's the first day and date film that you launched. I mean, I just want to be clear. I've never had a day and date film. That's right. So that's the first day and date film that you launched. No, that was not day and date. I've never had one. Well, sorry, your first collapse window. And no, the reason, it wasn't the, reason, the first, but I, we, we, we have experimented only but, because but, it's not part of our philosophy. Right. But what I would say, and, and not to be critical of you or your company, because you've had an incredible history and you've created the business that we all work in, but I just want to, you know, the fact that you wouldn't entertain doing something differently and you were doing the same thing over and over one size fits all for me that's the liability that puts you behind the eight ball coming into the pandemic where for us having been in that scenario where we're trying to find out what transactional vod can be for independent film what happens with this film if we collapse the window is incredibly I helpful i understand that tom but i need to interrupt you the reason that sony classics is the way it is has to do with all the opportunities in pay television and television and output deals and things in home entertainment that cause us to do that, that make the most amount of money for our movies. That is why historically it wasn't, it was, we did, we, we conduct our business the way we do, just like historically you do what serves your movies. But we, we have output deals too. And what I'm saying is you should challenge your output deals. You should challenge Sony leadership to think differently about it. And, 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 and we are in this situation now, which unfortunately is a different circumstance, but for me highlights what's wrong with our industry. But I don't think we're doing a good enough job of embracing all the tools at our disposal to create more film fans and to still embrace cinema. And that's, you know, I, I, you know, I remember this quote that you did in IndieWire. You said, well, we're going to sit on the sidelines till theaters return. I was like, well, that's a mistake. People want to see movies. I don't Filmmaker. 
And I and I would just say too that it's like you know, and I can't speak to what your future plans is, but we can't kind of go back to what was normal after the pandemic is over. You know, we, we've taken so much of what we've learned in the last two years, and we're going to apply it to everything in the future. And it's like it is it is a whole different world. Everyone keeps saying, "When are we getting back to normal?" We're not. <laughs> we're not getting back to normal. It's a completely different yeah, world, and it's I agree exciting. With that. But I, I do want to say the reason that line was said in the, what had to do with the father, and I'm really glad we didn't sell it to Netflix or Amazon or any of those places, and we did sit on the lines and wait for it on that movie because it served that movie. That's what that line was about, just you know that. Well, we, we, went, to back, we went back to work within two weeks. We, it was our mission to get films back in audiences' hands in a way that you know, was a compromise of what we had wanted to do, but honestly was in service of our filmmakers and the audience. And for us to get back to work, it was, it was just a commitment that no matter what the circumstances are, we're gonna get back to work. And so the one thing I wanna mention though, where all of this I think comes together is the film forum. The film forum is one of the oldest theaters in the city. It's kind of outdated, right? I mean, your grandma goes there. That's not actually the case, but you would think, well, what are they gonna do in virtual cinema? How are they gonna deliver an audience that is as old fangled as the, the customers that show up there? It's one of the most successful virtual cinema performing uh, numbers that I've seen during the pandemic because they are connected with their audience, that they are digitally interacting with their audience. And I can't say that for some of the bigger gun theaters in New York or LA. So it's clear that if you're not in touch with your customers, whether you're an exhibitor, whether you're, um, a platform or, or, or a distributor, I think you're gonna miss out, so. It, it pains me to note that we are actually coming close to the end of our time, because um, I feel like this could go longer, um, for sure. It's gonna continue uh, beyond this moment, uh, these conversations. But uh, I did wanna leave a moment, if I could, just for a question. I know you guys probably have a million questions. We probably only have time for one, maybe two, but um, if any of you guys have, have any questions. Yeah, right here. Um, I had just seen um, talked about all the exhibitors and that kind of stuff and more about genre of film that you didn't have a visual team have done a lot about the audience sort of played a much larger part in like what goes into theaters and what goes on to streaming, et cetera, et cetera, of like the like Do you mean how do we as distributors decide yeah. how to release a, a certain type of film? No, based like how, but also like, wait, yes, and also like, what do you do? Like, how do you decide what you want to release? I think I understand your question. Yeah. And, and I will say that the VOD space is, it's not about quality. It's about understanding what the film is. If the film knows exactly what it is based on poster, based on cast, if it, all those elements are complementary, regardless of quality, you're gonna do really well. And that's not the case for what we do. What we do is wholly based on quality. So I think that's the spectrum of, you know, a Netflix film sort of washing over you because it knows exactly what it is. It's serving a very clear genre. It's cast in a way that serves that genre, you know, um, and, and I think that's, it, it doesn't confuse the consumer, as it were. And, and so I, I think that's why, honestly, you know, J.J. Abrams said this great thing uh, at this convention in L.A. about going back to the theaters. He said, you know, when you're at home, uh, you're, you're the parent and the TV's your child. You're in complete control. But when you go to the theater, you're the child. And what's up on screen is in complete control. And therefore, that commitment you make as an audience to go see it in a theater, you, the filmmaker can demand so much more of you. And I think that's why it's so much more of a rewarding experience. We also saw that the um, certain genres like you're referring to would go through the roof and the attendance was cult-like. So we saw it with The Conjuring and we saw it with certain things that they had the, the return views for certain types of people. 
um, that data was really strong. So I think you're on to something talking about the different genre types. There are definitely these subgenres that people really like. One more, yes, Eric. You predicted it would win. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it was just, uh, I mean, it was, it was time for as many people to see the film as possible. And um, through the film festivals, which are so, were so important, are so important. And um, the, 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 the very, like the, the top 10 film lists at the end of the year, like there just was a, certain amount of momentum building that happened you know within the industry within the press bubble that then sort of it's like concentric circles that in in previous to to the pandemic would have followed you know much more of a traditional platform art house release and in a way that the debut on hulu was its wide break um in a sense uh and it was just kind of doing something that had been done before, but with different platforms, different venues, versus you know it being in the AMC in your local mall in February. It was on Hulu. Um, so I hope but that there makes were also sense. a lot of theaters that weren't open, so right. it was a wise choice. Yeah. Yeah, it almost had a feel of like the DVD release, in a sense, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Of just like yeah, I mean, not right not to moment. not to look at the awards campaigns in a kind of well, I guess I am, but the traditionally with with the with the Academy Awards specifically, specialty releases depending on when they open. But if you consider it a fall film, the 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 volume of business that you do between nominations and the actual awards themselves is usually the highest percentage of, you know, it's usually like 65%. I mean, it's something like Slub Dog Millionaire made a vast majority of its, of its business between nominations and the awards, Birdman, 12 Years a Slave, um, because that's the sort of highest awareness, the peak awareness level. Once the awards happen, generally it kind of goes goes away you used to be able to get one more week and then people would move on but now it sort of happens even more quickly um i can't even remember what my point is but um but but yeah sorry okay one one last one back in the back row there yeah Well, Michael knows these better than I do. He's been doing it a lot longer and at a much more successful level. So, you know, if Michael had not, if I had not been inspired by Kung Fu Hustle, you know, uh, you know, or E2 Mama Tambien, seeing foreign language films do, you know, Amelie. So I knew it was possible. And uh, with Parasite, you know, sitting in a vacuum, not really knowing where we were going yet, but having worked with Bong for 15 years, I just, this guy's the best director in the world. This film, we tested it, tested it off the charts, like in a way that I, I just couldn't believe. And, uh, you know, we, I never could have predicted 53 million, let's be clear. But I thought getting into the teens, yes, I think that's possible, we should do it. Um, Titan's a whole different beast. It won the Palme d'Or, and it's as historic a Palme d'Or, possibly more historic than maybe even Bong, Bong Joon-ho's Best Picture Oscar. I know that's very controversial, but you know, uh, for the second woman, but the first outright woman to win the Palme d'Or, it's a pretty big deal considering the number of directors who've come through this world. Uh, I just, you know, implicitly seeing it in a vacuum, I thought this is the future of cinema. This is the future of cinema. I don't know why specifically, but I've never seen anything like it. And it's doing things that I think move well beyond what you can write on the page. It feels nonverbal in this way. It feels abstract and therefore explains so much more and uh, is a horror film, but is it? It's a love story. It's a family story. I, it's all of these things, speaking to your point about genre, the fact that you cannot classify it for me is what makes it really, really special. So. 
Um, yeah, we, we took a huge leap this weekend. 500 plus prints. Oh my God. You know, it's the second highest grossing opening for a French film of all time, right? So that's amazing that we're doing that in a pandemic. Would I have preferred to platform it? Yes, but you know what? It's a really tight schedule. We've got to go for it and, you know, credit to Hulu, credit to our output deals, credit to our previous success that we have convinced Hulu that foreign language films are worth as much as English language films, right? That didn't happen before we came onto the scene. That didn't happen before we launched Neon. We also convinced people to believe that nonfiction are as valuable as fiction films in theater. And so we're agnostic about genre, we're agnostic about size, and we're auteur driven. So all those films are the same. I think of Honeyland the same way as I think of um, one of my favorite films on our slate, a little Swedish film called Border. They're all the same to us. And, and to your point about subscription, if you like one of our films, I think you're gonna like one more and you're gonna dip in for a few more. Um, Bye bye, well, Baco. We just lost a panelist. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> See you. <laughs> thank you so much, Ariana. And thank you very, please join me in thanking this fantastic panel. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.